today on an all-new Jason. It's our own Christmas spectacular with my very special guest, Dan Loria. It's all coming up next. Stay tuned on Jason. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and for spending your Christmas and New Year's with us. Joining me today on this very special Christmas special of The Jason Galka Show is Dan Loria, who you recognize, I'm sure, from the Wonder Years, a hit sitcom back in the 90s, and more currently, Sullivan and Son on TBS. Well, he is here in New York for a limited time only, performing live on stage everyone's favorite Christmas story every year, a Christmas story. Dan, welcome to you. Thanks, Jason. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Same to you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for coming down to the Gansvert Hotel today. Beautiful hotel, one of Very our sponsors. Nice. Uh, so let's talk about the Christmas story. We all have seen it, but now it's been brought to life as theater. Well, yeah, we're never ahead of the audience in this play. You know, as soon as the crate <laughs> comes out with Fragile written on it, about 20 guys yell out, Fragile! You know, so <laughs> as soon as they see the flagpole, they know the boy's going to stick his tongue on it. And, uh, but that's, you know, that's one of the things I love is a lot of, especially the adults, they walk in with that little chip on their shoulder. You know, what have you done to my favorite movie? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come right out and say it. The play's much stronger than the movie. Yeah. Wherever Ralphie fantasizes in a movie, that's a production number now. And a couple of the numbers are as big as any production number you'll see on Broadway. Busby Berkeley would be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> But you are no stranger to the stage at all. I mean, you've done the Wonder Years, you've yeah. done, you're doing Sullivan and Son now, you've done many guest appearances over the years. But you've stated before that you do one show live every year. Yeah, I've one never, uh, I was very fortunate to uh, meet Charles Durning the first month I came to New York. He was like my dad. And then later on, uh, Jack Klugman. And both of them were real theater rats. You know, they, they would, Charlie told me 35 years ago, if I ever went a year without doing a play, he would never talk to me. So <laughs> I never went a year without doing a play. And here you are still performing. It's your 60th, right? 60th, 60th play. play. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, both Charlie and Jack passed away uh, while I was doing A Christmas Story last year on Christmas Eve, four hours apart. Wow. Yeah. That's sad, though. Yeah. But amazing they inspirations. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, they were the old school. <laughs> But that's the way things should be done, right? I mean, that's the way the best productions went out was old school style. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, they had a real love of the art of acting. Mm -hmm. And it was also in the time when, uh, you know, they survived as actors through doing television, a lot of live television back then, which yeah. is gone. But they also, on their episodic television, they did three, four minute takes without a cut. Whereas today, I mean, it, uh, Argo won Best Picture, and the longest take without a cut is less than 20 seconds. Wow. So it's a different art form. You know, I'm not saying it's easier or harder. It's just different. Right. Uh, back when Charlie and Jack started, you had to be an actor. You had to be a stage actor. You didn't have a choice. There were very <laughs> few people who made it without doing their tour through the theater. You know. Yeah. Nowadays, most of the colleges... Uh, well, you look back 25 years ago, it, they, it said theater department. Now it says communications department. Well, yes, so we have a lot of actors who have never done a play. Yeah. yeah. But it absolutely helps in, in acting, I'm sure. I mean, you know, going from the big screen to the stage, I mean, it's a big transition for a lot of people, I'm sure, yeah. but it certainly keeps you up on your game. Now, what is it like to play the role of Gene Shepard in A Christmas Story? Well, you know, after doing Lombardi, who's, you know, when Coach Lombardi said hello, hairs on your neck stood up. <laughs> you know, and Gene Shepard, you know, as soon as you, he, he was a kind of a grouchy guy in real life, but as soon as you heard his voice on the radio, it was this mellowness, mm -hmm. and it was a calm. Uh, we were talking about it before. I think the only one today who could even compare to him is uh, Keeler from uh, Prairie Home Companion, you know? Right. So we don't have those storytellers anymore. Yeah. And it's great to... To go from Lombardi to Gene Shepard. As an actor, that's, I can't, couldn't think of two more different people. You know. And you were born in Brooklyn here in New born York. Born in Brooklyn. And then you were raised out on Long Island. Lindenhurst. Another Long Island native. Yeah. Riverhead, <laughs> Lindenhurst, here we are. Not that far apart, but no. far enough, I'm sure. Suffolk County. Yeah. yeah. 
same county that's all that matters. Yeah. So you actually went to college on a football scholarship. How did you end up as an actor? I was telling a joke. Uh, it was in spring practice my junior year. And a little old lady came up and tapped me on my shoulder pads <laughs> with a cane. I was telling a joke before practice. And she said, would you like to be in a play? And I said, uh, I always wanted to try that. And uh -huh. She said, I know. And I said, how would you know? And she said, because I'm the greatest acting teacher in the world. And it was Constance Welsh who had started the Yale Dramat. Wow. And uh, she needed a big, ugly guy to play Calaman. So she brought me over, stuck me in a student production first. Um, and a thousand clowns played Arnold, the brother, and then I did Caliban next. And huh. I said, "This beats working." Yeah, it's just been up from there, I'm sure. Well, you know, I was uh, three years in the Marine Corps, and I went to graduate school at UConn, mm -hmm. taught for a year, and uh, I didn't come into the city. I was th I was 28 years old. I started late. Wow. Well, I'm 29 and doing a talk See? show, so you're never too late. <laughs> never too late. Never too late. But back then, again, uh, you had to do theater. You know, agents actually came to the theater. Casting directors came to the theater. Now they ask for a reel or disc or tape, and it's all edited. So, right, it's a whole different, different ball game. Do you find it as an actor now? Do you find it easier or harder to break into the field? Oh, I think it's ten times harder now. Yeah. Because again, you don't have to act. You you have some machine that's looking at your face. Mm -hmm. I think it's ten times harder for women too. I mean, the ratio is uh, almost eight to one now, ma male roles to female roles. So a friend of mine who actually does soaps, um, she teaches a couple of seminars here in New York, and she had actually said, and I don't know how true it is, it probably is very true, but it's 80% marketing and 20% talent to be an actor and be able to make it. Do you agree now? with that? Now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say, I'd say so. I'd say when I started, I would reverse those figures. Right. But I think now marketing... It, because of the technology, because of the mm -hmm. massive editing that's done. We have actors, uh, I'm working with young people today who, you know, they can't do two lines together. They do a line say, let me say that line again. Let me say that line again, because yeah. they know it's going to be cut. So the marketing, you know, the powerful agents who package a film. Yeah, I would agree with that. 80% of that has got to be marketing. So because of technology now, we can cut and we can go back and edit. I mean, for you as an actor, is it easier for you to do your job now? I, you know, Is it like less pressure for you? It, it, well, there's no pressure. They're just going to redo it. Yeah. You know, every time somebody comes on, uh, on Sullivan and Son, uh, Steve Byrne, the star, he, he always has them come talk to me if they're a little nervous about it. Because uh -huh. I always tell them, no matter how good you are or how bad you are, we're going to do it again. So just relax, <laughs> enjoy, have fun. And of course, the more fun we have, the more fun we shoot in front of a live audience right. than they have. And, and, they and have the producers are just going to cut it up anyway. Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. The audience has so much fun with that stuff because for them, they're not actors. Because it's live. Yeah, it's live. And they're not actors. It's yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah. It's fascinating to me prior to doing this. I did a movie over the summer for HBO, and I'm sure it's a lot different doing film than television right. because we did the same thing, I kid you not, like 200 times. I must have walked down the same flight of steps yeah. until they got the shot that they wanted. Yeah, and supposedly <laughs> the technology is going to save us money. Uh -huh. No way. No, no, that was a long day. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so now we're moving on to The Wonder Years, which was everybody's favorite show in, in the late 80s Good to early 90s. Excellent writers, fabulous actors as usual. What was that whole experience like for you? Well, you know, it, it, I didn't think it would go because I thought the writing was too good. Allie, who played my wife, she on, doing the pilot, she said, Dan, we got a winner here. And, uh, of course, we, our uh, pilot aired after the Super Bowl, and we had the unbelievable ratings. And everybody said, oh, the next week it will drop, and the next week it actually went higher. Wow. So we actually surpassed the Super Bowl. But, you know, what people don't realize is back then, if you look at that show now, that was reality TV then. That's, Almost. You know, well, I, mean, you I wouldn't reality call reality today. TV, Well, because yeah, it was taking, scripted. Right, but I'm taking reality today only because I say that because that was real life to a lot of people. Back oh, yeah, then. You yeah. Know, work, you know, Jack Arnold worked his butt off yeah, for we, his family at a job he hated. Yeah, we didn't, uh, it was a real family. Luckily, because I wouldn't have got, I didn't have a, you know, a big agent or anything like that. 
Uh, I got it strictly through auditions. Uh, but the thing I'm most proud about the Wonder Years is uh, the kids are all doing great. Yeah. You know, Fred Savage is the leading four camera director in Hollywood. I mean, we've tried to get him on Sullivan and Son twice. He's just always working. Right. So hopefully next year he's going to direct a couple of them. Good, good. Uh, Jason Hervey played the older brother. He's one of the leading producers of reality TV. Uh, Josh Saviano played Paulie. Uh -huh. He's an entertainment lawyer. the big glasses. Right. <laughs> he's an entertainment lawyer, and he's the lawyer for Spider-Man, the play. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, Danica, she has her fourth math book coming out. She's wow. absolutely gorgeous. She's a good actress. And again, in the old days, somebody yes. would give her a series because, you know, Louis B. Na Mayer's name was on everything. Fred Silverman's name was on everything. Right. Brandon Tartikoff's name. And they wanted to take pride in it. So instead of putting Lindsay Lohan or Paris Hilton in a series, they would take Danica McKellar, put her in a series, and brag about this girl has written four math books and is an icon to these young girls. Absolutely. I mean, I find it hard to believe that she's doing math books now. She was such a great actress. I mean, I was yeah. young when the show was on. And, and even though it was kind of short-lived, it was five seasons, I believe, mm -hmm. it still was an Emmy Award-winning show. Yeah. Superb ratings. And as you said, they went up every week. Yeah. I well, mean, that's got to be something to be so proud of. Danica, uh, she came to New York, and I took her to see Proof. And she said, I'm, I'm not going to do West Wing next year. I'm going to do the play. And she did. And take a look at the reviews she got at the San Diego Rep for that. Wow. Yeah. But it's such a great show. And that probably is what you are best known for. Sullivan's Son is doing phenomenal as well. It's a hit series on TBS. But Wonder Years, you hear Dan Laura, you hear Wonder Years. Yeah, well, yeah. it was... You know, as an actor, there was a, it was a challenge because whenever you see a close-up of me or Allie that played the wife, the kids aren't there. They weren't in school. We're talking to exes on chairs. Wow. You know, that's when you say, how much do you pay me for this? Okay, I'll do it. You know? So that's so. actually interesting. So how did rehearsals go if they were in school and, and you guys were free all day? to? Well, to it, was, uh, it was pretty similar. We would, you know, it was single camera. So we would rehearse the scene. We would shoot a master. We would shoot Fred's close-up. Then we would move everything to the next scene. Fred would go to school. Okay. And then we, he would come out. We would rehearse that scene, do a master, do his shot, and then next school. Then, at the end of the day, we'd shoot the adults. So you had to remember his reactions and everything. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I would love to see like a behind-the-scenes footage of that, because that's just got to be so fascinating. Well, we actually enjoyed it. The kids were yeah. great. Just like in A Christmas Story, the kids are they're fun to be with. Mm -hmm. you know? They're the best actors. You know? yeah. And they always say, Dan, you got any notes? I said, yeah, don't act. <laughs> don't act. It's better, more natural, wouldn't you say? I mean, even though you're playing the role of Gene Shepard in A Christmas Story at Madison Square, it's, it's, you're throwing your own personality into it as well, I'm sure. Well, yeah, I have to, because uh, if I tried to do Gene Shepard's voice, uh, the play would go out at too slow a pace. Uh -huh. You know, my job is to keep that play moving, get us to the next song. Right. So you, you have to adjust. It's not like Lombardi. I had to do his voice, but Lombardi was at such a speed it kept it going anyway. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but Jack Klugman always had the best line. He always said, took me 10 years to learn how to act, <laughs> and 35 years to learn how not to. <laughs> you know, I so, can believe that. Yeah, uh, you, you, you try to, if you see the machine working, it's something, you're not doing something right. Right, right. Yeah. So with the Wonder Years, I mean, what are some of your best memories that you walked away from that show with? Well, you know, again, uh, the kids, they all were, we knew was, even when the show left, these kids are good kids. You know, you know, the public only hears about the kids who wreck hotel rooms. And, mm -hmm. But, you know, our business is like anybody else's business. 85% of the people in our business are hardworking, they care about their art, what they're doing, and 15% are jerks. And the only difference with our business is, is we promote the jerks. We don't promote the 85% who really care about what they're doing. That's I never true. understood that. Right. You know, I, every talk show I'm on, I try to talk about Danica because I'm so proud of her. Yeah. So why isn't the network talking about her? Why I doesn't she have a series? I've seen photos of her. She's a beautiful young She's woman. She's stunning. She is. Yeah. She's I, exactly what you thought Winnie Cooper would grow up to be. <laughs> so that's how hot she is, you know. But I see her just bursting with personality. I mean, I remember Winnie was very, like, kind of shy and, and kind of kept to herself as a character. 
But I look at her photos, and this girl is just blossoming with personality. Oh, yeah. She's, she's just She's good. gorgeous. Yeah. No, I, she comes over, watches old movies. She uh-huh. cares about her art. So you keep in touch with a lot of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't see Fred as much as I'd like to, but that's because he's busy. Right. Jason I only see when he comes to town. Josh I see when I come to New York and do a play. He's, he came a Christmas story. You know, nice. So we, we, we keep in touch. I, I go see anything Allie is in. Uh-huh. She comes and sees anything I'm so in. So she's still working as well? Yeah, she's uh, still on one of the last soap operas left. Wow, after which one? I just started I a new really... soap opera. It's starting yeah. next month. Look I for it. I forgot which one she was in. <laughs> Uh, I forget. I forget yeah. it now. Well, you did a little one life to live yourself as well. Two years. It's where I met Judith Light. Yeah. Yeah. When That's I got a great Lombardi and yeah, Judith is great. When I got uh, when I they said okay, you're going to be Vince Lombardi, Tommy Keller, a great director. He said, give us some names. We'll be glad to audition them. You know. And the very first name I gave him five names. The very first name I gave him was Judith Light. Uh-huh. And a lot of people were like, oh. Two TV people, I don't know. Maybe we should get a Broadway person, you know. I said, why don't you just see her, Tommy? Right. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be there when he auditioned her. But they didn't say, oh, go home, we'll let you know. They said, could you wait in the outer office? And they called me and they go, she's got it. We're not letting her leave. <laughs> you know, so they actually brought her in and well, put her on the phone with me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, are you kidding? You she's ever- won two Tonys since yeah. Lombardi. Good she's she's one of the finest people I've ever, you know, her, people don't understand that, like, like somebody like Wendy Malick, mm-hmm. you see her in Hot in Cleveland. Well, I did the guys with Wendy Malick. You want to see a good dramatic actress. <laughs> and Judith, you know, who's the boss? That's all I hear. Did you see her do Wit? When no, I saw her do Wit, I said, I got to do a play with this lady. Yeah. But I knew that back on the soap opera. I remember a lot of her commercials that she did. I remember a lot of her Lifetime movies. I was a big yeah. Lifetime fan. And, but I, I saw Who's the Boss, of course. I mean, that was another hit show in okay. the 90s that you watched. I mean, you were glued to the TV back then. You know, you didn't have your iPad and your iPhone to, no. to catch up like that. You had to watch it on TV, and that was it. Yeah. You know. And those 90-minute uh, movies, movie of the weeks, uh-huh. you know, people don't realize back then we didn't do pilots. You did a movie of the week. Right. And then they would test it, and then they'd say, okay, let's make a series. And, there, and again, it was a smart business because mm-hmm. now they make 20 pilots when they only need four. Yeah. So 16 of these hour shows are a total waste of money. Mm-hmm. Back then, we did 90-minute movies of the week, and the four that you thought would be a series, they were made. The other 16, <laughs> you sold to these cable channels. Interesting. You had a product to sell. So right. I love when they say to the artists, we don't understand the business. <laughs> well... I think we'd have a better batting average than these guys. Yeah, I think you have a great understanding. I mean, have you ever thought about being like a, a casting director or an agent yourself? No, no, no. I only want, I have a shirt that says, no, I don't want to direct. Mm-hmm. I only like to act. I write a little bit, but I write for my friends, you know. So. Interesting. Well, you are a writer. You have a series book out there as well, which we're going to get to. We're going to take a quick break here, and we come back more with Dan Laurie on our very special Christmas segment of the Jason Galka Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It is our Christmas spectacular today here at the Gansberg Hotel on Park <laughs> Avenue in New York. And I'm joined with a very special guest today, Dan Laurier, who is back in New York for a limited time only, performing live on stage, A Christmas Story. Dan, great to have you back. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. So before we took a break, we were talking about A Christmas Story, performing it live on stage. We got mm-hmm. through the Wonder Years history. Your most recent project you're on now is Sullivan and Son on TBS. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's uh, based on the humor of Steve Byrne, who's the star of the show, who is a stand-up comic who is half Irish and half Korean. And I play his father, and Jody Long plays the mother, and it all takes place in a bar in Pittsburgh. And there are three other stand-ups who are friends of uh, Steve's that are in the show, Uh Owen Benjamin and Roy Wood and Ahmed Ahmed. And, of course, we have the old-timers, Christine Ebersole (laughs) and Brian Doyle, Marie, Jody, and I. Right. And we have two young girls, Valerie and Sue, so they're great. Yeah. It's such an interesting show, and it's hysterical as always. And I mean, this is such a different role than playing Jack Arnold, isn't it? Because I remember Jack being like, you know, like we talked about earlier, he he hated what he did. He was very stern-looking. Didn't smile very much. No, (laughs) and you're the complete opposite. Look at you. (laughs) No, in Sullivan and Son, I'm... I'm, uh, you know, I'm the sane one in the asylum, you know, so I'm allowed to smile. I'm allowed to laugh. You know, it's like Judd Hirsch in Taxi. Usually right. the story is not about Judd Hirsch. He's the one that gives the moral message. And 
Kind of Sullivan and Son, I'm, I'm, I kind of do that. So it's a very fun show. There's probably a lot of oh. hysterical moments that go on off camera that we, the audience, don't get to see. Yeah, uh, well, the audience that's there on the night of shooting, they get to see some funny stuff, stuff that'll never make the air. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's amazing. The more fun we have, the more fun the audience has. Right. You know? So if you ever come out to LA, you got to come to a tape. Absolutely. Thing. You'll be upset they pay me so much to do that. Just say, you get paid for that? Yeah. I might ask you for a job. Yeah. Well, I don't have power on that. I, there's a lot of actors I would love to get jobs for. So. Right. But such a great show. I mean, is this like, are you back in your element now? Because you do have such a very big, bubbly personality about you. And I feel like Sullivan that you're playing in uh, Sullivan and Son, like this is like the perfect role for you. Uh, it's, it's so much fun. I wouldn't say it's a perfect role for me, but... Well, you know, your it allows. I think. Yeah, well, I don't know. You know, actors, we kind of change with. I wouldn't want to get pigeonholed in one thing. You know, for a long time after the Wonder Years, it was always play the father, play the father, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, but I like, like, that's why I love the theater, because you get to really, to go from Lombardi to Gene Shepard, mm -hmm. you know, and that was in one year. You know, it's not like five years later, somebody let me do something else. So is that kind of like a big transition to, to go from one personality to the other? Well, it's a different research. It's a different attitude on stage. You know, it's all about creating that attitude and having the confidence to go with it. You do know? you have a preference as opposed to, uh, you know, performing on stage as, as opposed to performing on television? Do you prefer one over the oh, other? No, oh, as an actor, you, it's always a theater. Yeah. Any actor worth his salt goes back to the theater. Is that because you got your start or that's how it was when you... Well, as the technology improves, and, or if you want to call it improvement, but as it advances, um, the art of acting is only on the stage because you have to maintain a characterization for the full two hours. I mean, right. start and go, you're in character. You know, and that's really what acting is about. You know, being in front of the camera now, it's, it's about filling that editing machine. Uh -huh. Which, and I'm not putting that down. That's not easy to do to, you know, I mean, you see a really fine young actor like a Leonardo DiCaprio or Johnny Depp to create that character that I do on stage and then to be able to drop it every five minutes and recreate it. You understand why it might take them a few takes or anyone a few takes to get to that character, but at least they go for a character, uh -huh. you know. Uh, George Clooney wrote about it and he has a, a a great article about how hard it is to get a thing of quality done. And quality for an actor means to be able to create a character, you know, not just sell a personality. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, good. No, it's great to see you back on TV. I mean, you're always on TV. You've done guest yeah. roles over the years, but to be back on a sitcom a week. That's a very day. nice way of saying I'm old. No, yes, not I've a, done over experience. 75 guest you're, spots. You're, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. That's it. Well, we've done almost 75 shows. There you go. <laughs> So. so we're climbing the ladder, too. But moving on, you actually have a book that's out as well, The Godfather Tales, The Blue Hair Club. Yeah, it's uh, uh, just three little short stories that I gave to my godson. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do at least three more. So it's a series called The Godfather Tales. But um, my godson, he's, very, he's only seven, but he's very smart. He knows more about a computer than I do. <laughs> but I, I, I realize that young people today actually feel they know more than any teacher they have. And they may be right in some way. Because if you ask a young person now, like, what are the original 13 colonies? They pull out their phone. And then they could say to you, do you know, yeah. do you know which Google one it. had, yeah, <laughs> you know, which one had the highest population? Do you know who discovered each one? So you ask a young kid, what is the chemical symbol for gold? And they'll and they'll tell you, well, what's, do you know what copper is? Do you know what silver is? So they feel they know more, but what they can't do is create. Right. So the little stories I have are, they're very odd little stories that always have a moral message. You know, um, the girl with the rhinoceros in her mouth, the girl who fell through the hole in her sock, the boy who ate his car, you know, and they're <laughs> all, but they all have these little stories and a moral message at the end. And, um, I said to my godson the other day, uh, I am not going to write another one until you create a story. He goes, oh, I can't create a story. I said, well, something will happen at school today. Right. And you can make a story out of it. You make a story out of anything. Uh -huh. 
and he had an art class where the teacher explained what a self-portrait was. And he came running home, he said, I got one, I got one. The moose who painted his self-portrait. And it's a story about all the other animals wouldn't talk to the moose because the moose was so ugly, and at least that's what the moose thought. Right. And then he was drinking water, and he saw himself and said, I'm not so ugly. And he painted a beautiful portrait of himself on a rock. Fantastic. That's he, a great message in there. Yeah, he, the, the message was that before other people could see you in a good light, you have to, you see, to yourself see yourself in a good light. And this is what the stories are. But you have to encourage kids nowadays to create. Mm -hmm. You can't just give them a test and say, oh, you want me to put what's on my phone on that piece of paper? That's not education. It's right. not creating. And what a great thing for our business to yeah. have all these people trying to create stories. Absolutely. I have all the kids on the Christmas <laughs> story writing little stories. One of them, Gabriella, has written a gorgeous one about spilling a Coke uh, on her father's time machine. Uh -huh. And it lands where Marilyn Monroe was. And she comes today. And, of course, she wants to go back until she sees a movie about her stuff. And now she doesn't want to go back. Interesting. Isn't so these nice? were stories that you told to your godson. I mean, what was the inspiration to put them into print? Well, it was actually his mother, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine Farnsworth. And she just loved the stories, and she had me record them to him. And she was playing them to some of the kids in the school. And she said, you know what? I'm going to put them in a book. So she co-authors them. She edits them. I just tell stories. I think you're a great you know? storyteller. I mean, during the break, people at home didn't see, but we were talking, you know, about yeah. acting. Well, that's and, what and acting getting, is, yeah. telling stories. It's te it was great yeah. stories, actually. I wish yeah. you guys could have been here. But uh, just fantastic. Oh, I love, you know, a lot of my good friends now are gone, like Charlie Durning and Jack Klugman, Peter Falk, Dom DeLuise. We all used to go to dinner at Hal Gould, and I would just sit there and throw out a name. Like, if you threw out Dean Martin, forget it. <laughs> they all love Dean Martin. They could talk about Dean Martin. No. And then wow. the great actors they work with, George C. Scott, and uh -huh. people like that. And, uh, you know, Jack Klugman knew John Garfield very well. He was actually at his house when he got his subpoena to appear before the House on American Activities Committee. Wow. So I would always bring some young writers so I could hear the same stories over and over. <laughs> yeah, when they're fast. I mean, we, we were just telling, you were just telling us a story, actually, about uh, being roommates with Ed O'Neill, who played on Married with Children. Yeah. That was Eddie, another great, well-known show back yeah. in, in the 90s. Eddie lent me the money for my rent because uh, he was in a play that was on Broadway, which was not a hit, yeah. and I was in a play off, off, not getting paid. That was the biggest hit in New York. <laughs> I'm not worried about Such you. Such a cliche. Yeah, right. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much. This has oh, been such an incredible me. Christmas segment. If you can, before the end of the month, get down to see Dan at Madison Square Garden playing live as Gene Shepard in A Christmas Story, everyone's favorite Christmas movie. You could also watch it all day on Christmas Day. It usually yeah. runs 24 hours, Plays I believe. better. The play is much better. Dan is in it. Phenomenal actor. I thank you. I thank you. I thank, thank you, you so much. Me. Merry Christmas to you. And as always, I thank you at home for watching. Special thank you to the Gansberg Hotel on Park Avenue for allowing us our beautiful setting today. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.